Hey, welcome to Basecraft. So I'm going to keep this brief as I'm after coming down with laryngitis and this is the first day I've been able to speak properly in about a week. So I'm um, just going to jump straight in. This week I'm talking to Andrew Pincock. Amp is his name on YouTube and he has a brilliant channel where he reviews gear and does kind of sound like videos where he helps you get the right sound for certain musicians. And um, we're both in love with the Zoom B3 pedal. So um, I was going to start doing videos on the Zoom B3, but then I found his channel and I was like, oh, he's got that completely nailed, so there's no point in me doing it. So it, what the Zoom is, briefly, is a, a very affordable multi-effects pedal that sounds brilliant. And um, I have one of the earlier models, which I prefer, because it has an XLR, but the pedal basically is a looper, it's a drum machine, it's an interface for recording and um, also a multi-effects unit and they usually come in around 100 euros or dollars whatever you're at and I um, absolutely love the pedal I just got it for practicing and I use it for gigging as well at the moment so I had a really good chat with Amp about what he's doing with his career as a content creator what he's doing with his music and of course we play it a good bit here on this one the Zoom B3 and um, yeah, I kind of got cut off a few times twice because it turns out that Zoom are now charging for what used to be free and they never told us about it. So I got a bit of a shock. We started the chat and it took us ages to arrange it because he's in America, I'm in Ireland with the times. And then I got the warning that I can only talk for an hour at a time. So I had to stitch the two episodes together. Hopefully it's fairly seamless. And um, with that in mind, I now have a Patreon set up to help with the podcast because uh, this is an independent podcast. It's... Um, supported by you the listener um there's a lot of kind of um commercial kind of podcasts starting like you know certain brands are starting their own podcasts and uh, i'm gonna say i'm compete i wouldn't say i'm competing with them but in a way i am because you know people only want to come on and chat so many times to different podcasts and when i started this i was one of the only bass podcasts and now there's other stuff coming on guitar bass podcast sponsored by people so um I really appreciate it if you could um, support me on Patreon to keep this going and because um, I'm finding it hard to get the time to do it at the moment but um, I want to keep doing it. I'm, have it I'm doing it once a month now and um, I have some really good guests lined up so I'd really appreciate it if you could just drop me a little um, bit of money on Patreon. So let's jump straight in. The voice is starting to go already. I um, recorded this before I lost my voice so you won't have to listen to this croaky um, voice for the whole episode. So yeah, see you soon. Andrew, isn't it? Not Amp. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, AMP are my initials. And a lot okay. of people call me Amp, but it's AMP. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to like, you can't give yourself a nickname, am I right? You just have to no, like, no. It, nicknames are earned, not demanded. Not there was always a man in school trying to become, you know, he was trying to get some street cred. He'd make up a, a name of some kind for himself, but it wouldn't stick, you know. No, they, they never do. If you just like bestow them upon yourself, it just doesn't work that way. And then he, he gets his teeth whitened or something a few weeks later and he gets the nickname like Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's earning a nickname. Yeah, that's how it happens. That'd be earned. Uh, speaking of earning things, well done on 10K, getting your oh, 10K subs. Thank you. It's it's uh, it's taken me far longer than it should have, but, uh, you know, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> you've been on, yeah, long. you've been on YouTube like you're an OG. You've been on it a good while. Yeah, let's see. I uploaded my very first YouTube video in January of 2007 when I was like 18 years old. And it was just me. I was, I was playing guitar along to like a Hawthorne Heights song. And I remember that video got a lot of hate because people thought I was faking it for some reason. And I was like, no, you can hear how out of tune my guitar is. That's definitely me jamming away in my bedroom. I don't know why you're upset. And it, and that what, what, two, when was that? 2000 and... 2007. Okay, geez. So you must have had like a pretty shitty camera and everything back then. Like. Oh, yeah. It was like just, you know, the family digital camera that I think probably had no more than like a one gig memory card in it. Like it was awful. It was terrible. <laughs> and it probably took me like three hours to upload it because our internet was terrible. And have you just been tipping away, like releasing videos sporadically ever since? Or was there kind of like a curve to you were busy, then you kind of stop and it's definitely come come in waves for sure. Because when I was initially doing YouTube, I just liked YouTube. I thought it was a cool platform. I was discovering people like, I don't know if you've ever watched him. Um, he doesn't really upload anymore. Fingers Moran. You ever heard of him? No, never heard he of him. A, he's a lefty bass player. And I remember like finding him on YouTube and be like, this guy's amazing. I want to play like this guy. Or like discovered Jack Conti and Pomple Moose, which maybe you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just. Them, yeah. 
saw, saw these people making YouTube videos and I'm like, these guys are so cool and I like this stuff and I want to do it too. But there was always this huge gap between my ambition and my skill. And that that's just like always been there and continues to this day, in my opinion. But most of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't until probably 2018 or 19 that I was just like, okay, you gotta you can figure this out. Cause like I'd had a couple of like videos that it like kind of popped off a little bit and like kind of encouraged me a little bit. And it wasn't until like pretty recently, like the last couple of years that I figured out, okay, this is this is what I need to make that people like and will watch. And it's things that I can actually like make ongoing content from. And that's always, you know, constantly evolving, but it wasn't until, yeah, just like the last three years that I figured out, okay, this is how I make videos. This is how I make them interesting. This is information people want and need. And then um, I think my channel doubled in the space of a year. And then the right. next year doubled again. So it's just been like, whoa, all at once. <laughs> Yeah. I know you put up because I think I was actually going to start putting up Zoom videos because I love the Zoom. We're kind of both of us are huge fans of this pedal, but you kind of have that niche cover. You're the, the <laughs> bass pedal guy on YouTube. Well, we'll, we'll see because uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's. But I I I only bought the pedal for practicing, but I'm using it for gigs now. Like we'll we'll, we'll get going on it in a, in a while, but we're gonna do like this is going to be like an introduction to you, but also kind of a special on how class the zoom pedal is yeah yeah but for sure controversial opinion i prefer my zoom pedal to my hx stomp it's just it's just, it's, just more, it's more it's more intuitive like you know i know the sounds in the hx are brilliant but i never use it i'm just like oh the zoom is zoom is just so much easier just i can i can work it easier i can get with the sounds i want and just go through mm -hmm. it i don't know yeah, I, I totally, well, I was in the kind of the same boat. I just bought it because I saw a lot of people were asking questions about it. And I was like, eh, I could do a video on it. And then I got it and I was like, okay, th this is a cool pedal and it's really portable and it's great for practice and has drum loops. It has all this stuff in it and it sounds great. Like people are just sleeping on this thing. And so I made a couple of videos on it and people were like, more, more, more. And I'd already, I'd um, simultaneously also had this, you know, the How to Sound Like series, which kind of morphed into the zoom pedal because it was like oh well not very many people have like you know um logic which is what i was building stuff mm. for but they do a lot of them have this pedal because it's cheap and easy to, to get right so i started like making that series all about that pedal and it it's, it's been it's been great it's been received really really well yeah it's class i think one of your videos that i like i think the one i discovered you it was because I was going to do one myself, like, what is the point of acoustic basses? And you did a really long, <laughs> but I, I think you've done a series of videos uh, about acoustic, uh, acoustic basses, not double bass. Acoustic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what would you call, how do you, what's the, how do you define, what would be the phrase? Um, for the, acoustic... the distinction you'd probably make is acoustic electric bass or. Yeah, that's the best way to call it, yeah. Or um, like the, um, um. PhD in, in bass would call it transverse bass because it's sideways instead of upright. Transverse okay. is the opposite or of, of upright. Yeah. We'll, we'll stick yeah. with acoustic electric. <laughs> That's just too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, for clarity's sake. But I I found the feckin' things completely useless in my entire life playing bass. And funnily enough, I was asked there before Christmas to maybe do a review of an acoustic bass. It never came about because something happened in the company and they didn't i didn't do the review in the end but i was really apprehensive about doing it because i was like i kind of hate acoustic basses i'm gonna have yeah. to play this bass before i review it i know that the company make really good basses but even at that i don't know is the best acoustic bass in the world still going to be decent enough for me to buy like yeah i i, th I think that that is just like um a difference in in use case because uh, I'm sure you know, like, because because you're you're more of a gigging player. Mm. You're you're playing in bands and you're getting up on stage and playing shows. And for those kinds of applications, acoustic bass is not very useful. They just create more problems than they have solutions. If you're the kind of player that just plays at home for enjoyment and you want something on the couch that doesn't require you to have an amp or anything, yeah, that's great. Acoustic bass is good for that. Or mm. if you need the acoustic bass aesthetic. Like if you want to do like the Alice in Chains, um, you know, unplugged MTV yeah. sort of a deal. But I'd just rather have a P bass. <laughs> like but, if I'm going to do anything like If that's the acoustic. only purpose for it, what's the point of spending thousands on one if it's just right. sitting on the couch strumming? Right. Not strumming, but 
clocking mm-hmm. away on. Yeah. And, and if like for practice purposes, like I want to practice on, on the base that I'm going to perform with. So like, yeah, it's just, th- there's just no place for it in, in, in what I do, but I, I could, I can see the merit for some people like white, some people insist on it and they kind of have to like do this weird, like mental gymnastics to be like, no, they are good. I promise they are good. Okay. Are they though? Yeah. Well, your, vi- <laughs> your video was pretty long. It was pretty in depth. Was it about like a half an hour, 40 minute video or something? What's funny is the the first video that I made on acoustic basses was a long time ago, and it's only like a four or five minute video. And that one kind of just like got lots of people upset. And I was like, OK, I'm coming back and I'm bringing somebody with a Ph.D. Or with scientific me. Scientific approach. <laughs> yeah. And so I got my uh, bass teacher, uh, Danson Angulo, who's brilliant and he's, you know, upright player and everything. But yeah, even even he's just like, yeah, acoustic bass is kind of blow. <laughs> <laughs> well, lads, if you like them, like you could comment and let me know, like why you think they're of, of use. But uh, maybe the fretless ones are pretty cool. If that is so, that's one area where they're, they're quite useful, you know, yes. Yeah, you can, you can do some solo bass stuff or it, they, they do sound really nice when they're fretless, I think. Yeah, yeah. There, there's definitely some, some little weird niches that you can find with that. And and it's like, if you want to make it your whole thing, then yeah, go for it. But just generally speaking, eh, take <laughs> it or leave you. it. Not for you. Yeah. But you have one anyway, because you bought one for the, the test. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, <got rid> of it. <laughs> no, in fact, the, I, there was an old Ibanez one that I used in my initial video, and that was my X's. And then the one that I got for the newer video was one that... Um, Denson had borrowed from a local shop because he knew somebody that had one. <laughs> okay, so I, so I've, I've, I myself have never actually owned one. <laughs> and do you do you do you buy a lot of bases and sell them for your channel? Because I know if I, you know Jody Dibble, his channel, he's literally yeah. constantly buying bases and selling them. Personally, I couldn't be arsed doing that. Like it's it's a lot of work. Like, dude, I, mm-hmm. I'm right there with you. It's a lot of work. I I just sold one base recently, and I was just like, oh my god, this is such a pain in the butt. Yeah, I could just buy my base and take it away. I don't want to haggle with you. I don't want all these weird questions about it. Just like, it's great. It works. I gigged with it. I don't want it anymore. You can have it for this much. End of story. <laughs> yeah, just take it. Just leave. I actually, you did the video on, you know, I have a GNL behind me. And that was, actually, oh, yeah. That was the first run when they came out first, the tribute series, the one I have. So it's, I think it's old now, like what, whatever year they were. I just, I got a base magazine and it reviewed it. The new base, the tribute series just came out. So I I blew my wad on it. I still regret it to this day. It is a brilliant <laughs> bass, but I should have bought like a P bass or a jazz bass back. It was, a, it was my first expensive bass ever. I only ever had like cheap beginner basses and I saved up all summer and I bought this GNL and it, it, the electronics don't even work anymore. Like no, these active oh. bases, they just don't last, do they? There's just so much going on them. You can't, when they break, it's like you look in, it's like a hydra's nest of wires. Like I, I can't fix this. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I, I kind of get the sense that you're like me, where you're way more interested in in playing than tinkering. Yeah, I do. T- I build bases and tinker a bit, but when it comes to electronics, no, I don't like active bases, even though I own a few. Like you know, mm-hmm. but yeah, you like that GNL when you did the review. You were you you gave it like a glowing review, so I was like, geez, I better I might yeah. be playing that thing again. It just sits on the wall there, almost never gets used. Like. It's it's a unique base for sure. The the one problem that I've had with it, well, I guess two problems. One, it's it's heavy. It's really heavy. It's got to be close to eleven pounds. Um, and then the other issue is that I where because I'm like you, I primarily play passive bases, and the output on that base is just ridiculous. Oh, so insane, you have to run, yeah. yeah, you have to run the volume at like halfway. And then like, if it gets bumped, then it changes all the time. Instead of just like with your normal base, you just like, oh, all the way up. That's just where it lives. Mm. But uh, otherwise that base is um, excellent. I just need it to be lighter. And the neck is ridiculous on my one anyway. It's like this baseball bat, huge thing on it. Like, I, I don't mind the neck. Like I'm, I'm a P base guy, so I'm kind of used to the chunk. Mm. Uh, well, you have like, did you get, what's that brand? Seric, you, did you get that recently? And you're like really into that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, big, in, big in fact, though. I, mean, I said that was, <laughs> that blew the, the bank of it. Oh, totally. Totally. It, it was, it's one of those things where you just kind of like hope that you like it when it shows up. And as it turns out, it's my favorite base. And speaking of like the GNL Seric thing, um, I have another Seric on order that's basically going to be a you know, the, the, the L2500, but in a Seric body. Oh, so okay. I'm hoping that I'll get like 
all those cool tones and have the five string, but not have to deal with the weight because Sarics are, are famously very, very light. And do you talk to the guy? Is I don't know, is it just one guy who runs the company or does he have like a few employees? Like it, it's it's one dude that runs the thing, and then I think he has two employees that help him actually build the instruments, which they're still like you know over a year out on orders. <laughs> so you're pretty you're directly talking to the guy making it when you're order, mm-hmm. and is it a lot dearer to get a, bo- a bespoke model like that than to pick one of his designs off the shelf like? Um, I didn't find it too difficult because I just very specifically knew what I wanted. Mm. And like on my on my first order, it was it was basic. It, it's just like a, a really basic uh, model that he just does. And I was just like, I don't know anything about woods and everything. He's like, ah, well, tone woods a myth. It doesn't matter. It's just aesthetic. And I was like, yeah, it cool. Matter. You're it you're my kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. Even though he's a base manufacturer, you could be like, oh, you got to get this wood and just keep bumping up the price. Yep. No, no, exactly. It's just mahogany and maple and i think it's jatoba fretboard fretboard yeah super super basic common woods and it's just like yeah just just choose whatever you think looks good because that's all that matters uh, and you don't find a create i would I don't, i've never spent crazy money on a base was it hard to put that much cash down or because it's such a unique thing it makes it worth it like instead of buying like a fender or a gibson for thousands you're at least you're buying something that's very unique like yeah it i mean it's it's a lot of money to drop because i i was like you for the longest time my most expensive base was like 350 bucks mm. and I, I kind of like wore that as a badge of pride it's like oh i can i can sound this good on a squire yeah. <laughs> you know kind of a thing but um yeah the Seric was probably the first like really really nice base i i because I, I never i'd never dropped more than a thousand bucks on a base before mm. and i i won't i won't sit here and say that it's worth it but I will say that I really like the bass. <laughs> I don't. I don't think anybody needs a bass that expensive. That that's it's a lot. I know, but I think most professional. Do you? You're you're playing. You're gigging and playing the whole time. So like most mm-hmm. people who do that, eventually they're going to treat themselves to something expensive, and it's okay. Then you can just. I suppose you can justify it even if you don't play gigs. If you have a good job, <laughs> and you're like, I don't get to yeah. do music for a living. Fuck it, I'm gonna blow thousands on a cool bass. Oh, to, oh, totally. That, I mean, that, and that's that's ultimately what I think people need to have the mindset. It's like, if you can afford it and you want it, go for it. There's no reason not to. Yeah, it, it's great for me anyway. All these guys, that, li- that bedroom bass players who are loaded because they're like doctors and whatever, <laughs> they're always selling their cool stuff for secondhand, like over here in Ireland anyway. And you, you go yeah. to his house, you buy it really cheap and it's like, it's brand new. The plastic is still on it and everything. <laughs> they never played the bloody thing. So it works mm-hmm. out great. Yep, the, the second-hand economy is where it's at. Cool. So, yeah, we're going to try something different for this week's podcast. Um, we said we're going to play a bit. Uh, since we're yeah. going into, into the B3, we'll go through some of our sounds. So, the, the you, I have the the B3, just the basic, I think it's the first one, is it? The one with the DI output, which is, I don't know yeah. why the newer ones don't have that feature, because it's very handy. I did a theater show before, and it was handy for them to take the DI to the you know, the main board. And then I had the other one going into my amp and we had different levels and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But the newer ones yeah. don't have a DI output. That's the only, but they have other features. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the B1X4 is the one that I, I've i got. And I do, I do wish there was a DI on it. They, they've got their newer, like bigger one. I'll, I might check that out at some point and it has a DI on it, but I, I kind of feel like that I would, I would just rather have a DI on the smaller, simpler mm-hmm. one, but you know, that's just how it goes. Um, so yeah, you want to get into some patches? Yeah, we'll go into some patch. How will we? Maybe if you just take a picture with your phone after and send them to me, I'll put them yeah. up on the screen. And yeah, we'll just make it work like that because I don't. Uh, if you don't own one of these and you're listening, this will be a good idea. I always say to someone if they're getting into bass effects and they're asking me what they should buy, I just tell them, well, if you don't have a bass muff, because that's the best distortion <laughs> fuzz pedal you can get. It just sounds unbelievable, like for any yeah. band, you know. But Apart from that, just buy the Zoom B3 and then get, if you like the sounds, maybe get the stomp versions or something. But that's the best way to get into effects pedals, I think, just to buy one of these. Especially this brand in particular, because it's cheap, but it sounds really yeah. good. Yeah, like, yeah. HX is like 500 euros, but you can buy one of these secondhand for 70 or 100 euros around that. Like, so totally no brainer i i I feel like the the one thing that i that i would say is don't get the the version with the the uh, expression pedal on it i have not found that to be very useful is it is it a cheap expression pedal 
or it, it's is- i don't think the the hardware is is bad i think that the the the, uh, the waz are not good i guess if you had like um some use for the volume pedal like if yeah. you want to do like volume swells you get use out of that i i think the waz on here are not very good <laughs> i actually have a, wa- a volume pedal i use with it but a volume pedal is cheap as so yeah plug in extra so yeah it's not mm-hmm. worth okay that's a good one because i might i might have got it with the expression pedal so you're saying they're not i use the auto on it when i want to get like a kind of a thundercat sound but yeah well yeah. and actually in fact I, i've got a thundercat patch on we, here we can compare our thundercat patches and see who has the best one <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> vote now on your phones and my model is a few, few years younger than your older than yours but so do they keep the same patches as it comes up as the new ones come out or is it always completely I new like I don't think so. Somebody, I, I put out a video on Duff McKagan and he uses GK stuff. And apparently they have GK models on the older ones and they don't have one on the new one. Yeah, I'm using um, a GK as my kind of uh, deep dirt sound on all my patches yeah. and it sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah, not on the new ones there. I don't know why they got rid of it. Maybe okay. licensing or something. I don't know. How's that coming through? Yeah, there you go. This is my... Um... Okay, so this is my uh That's my um my under my Thundercat with the auto uh Yeah, that's, that's perfect, dude. Is that close? Let's see. The the one that I got is if I can remember the part. I think you've got the the sound thing on Zoom. It's kind of cutting you out. If you if you uh, turn off original, go into your audio settings, and um, you're able to turn off the kind of suppress. It'll has like a noise cancellation thing. I can edit oh, this out. Oh, the I'll, noise cancellation. I'll, I'll edit this out in the podcast. So in su- suppress background yeah. noises. Put that to low. So that, because every time you play, it's kind of ducking oh, it in now. I see, I see. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, good. Yeah. So you, you've definitely got that like higher octave that I don't have. Got the, pitch, my... the pitch thing on, yeah. The yeah, pitch device. yeah. And I have oh, <laughs> I had that enough. I had that pedal uh, bypassed in here. Okay, no, that sounds good. It's pretty close, to the same as mine. I think yours sounds a little cleaner, actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really good. Like I, I use that gigging, and I like the sound of it. It's right on. auto uh, pitch thing. I suppose with for for me with the zoo, I'm always trying to find what can it do that my stomp as good as my stomp pedal, so I can just have that on the board without stomps. So for me, mm-hmm. I'm happy with the auto uh, envelope filter and the pitch shifting that I don't need to have a stomp for them when when I'm using them. It's cool. Eh? Sounds decent to me, like. What what other patches uh, do you like on it? The other one that I f- I feel like I go to a lot is just the I made a patch for Joe Dart and it's just a super basic patch because he doesn't use much. He's usually just like straight in. Yeah, have, have, but you've it's sort of see, you've seen his custom base. It just has one knob <laughs> and one pickup, no pain. Yeah, exactly. But oh. uh, just like super super basic. Uh, It's like a little compression and, and that's it but that's just like a nice clean sound to start from just for practice and stuff so it's almost like using the zoom like a sans amp kind of just to let you control the eq and get mm-hmm. some kind of a little bit of dirt maybe if you need it yeah it's like the the polar opposite of thundercats no effects no nonsense just just super basic uh, and do you gig with the zoom do you do you use it live this out as a kind of a preamp and for everything really 
I, I've used it a few times. Um, for for my main band, I'm I'm a little bit too too precious about the the couple of effects that I use for that band. But on like my uh, I do a lot of like one off like sub gigs, and I try and like use the zoom for that as much as possible. Mm. So I've had like country gigs, or I did like a classic rock show that that I used it with, and 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 where those the the needs for like lots of different effects is is quite a lot less for those shows. Mm-hmm. Um, because the um, the switching on the zoom is a little bit tricky. Like you have to like really know what you're doing and have things in the right spot. Oh yeah, I found that yeah it can be mm-hmm. if you're like what what happened to me was I was doing a gig and I had all my patches made, but they weren't you know set up as the set list went along. And then I got I, we did a segue between a song it was like it was a John Mayer. Know that good love is on the way. When I hit the E, I had to go into the next sound, but it was like four or five patches away. I was like stomping like a lunatic <laughs> trying to get to the thing. But the band was still after coming in. I was trying to stay on the E and get the riff going, but it was a disaster. Oh, <laughs> Obviously, no. with, with with individual stomps, you don't have that problem. You can just straight away get the sound. Mm-hmm. So so you're using it like um like different scenes of, of patches, right? Different groups of pedals and switching between uh, those. Well, in my main band, I use all individual stomps, but I'm doing a cover band at the moment and I'm trying to use the zoom for the cover band for everything. Just mm. easy because I leave my pedal board in the main band's van most of the time and I can just put this in a gig bag. So I'm trying to do it slowly, but yeah, it's hard to get all the scenes together and to make sure they're ready for the right song in the set. List. Oh, t- oh, totally. <laughs> Yeah, what what I was doing was the it has like the pedal board mode, so you just have one patch that has everything in it. But I would always have to be like, okay, this song uses the flanger, so I got to get the selector because you can only like cycle one pedal on and off mm. before you you have to. Oh, you can only like select one. I guess I guess that's just like the one downside to to the zoom. It's like the the advantage and the the disadvantage. And you can't expand complexity. it, can you? Because with the HX, you can buy like a little twenty euros two switch thing to give you five switches but i don't think you can do that with the hx can you oh yeah not with, the, with zoom. the zoom just... yeah mm-hmm. yeah what you what you got's what you got <laughs> which is probably good as well you know it re- restricts you so you have to be creative i came right, up with right. a nice sound well i bought this second hand i'm going to i actually didn't come up with this sound i was i was deleting the old sounds and i found this one <laughs> i don't know who the guy is i bought i don't know who i bought it off it was years ago um but this is a good one. A synth sound. I never really got many synth sounds on it before. So. Oh, there you go. I didn't know that's decent enough synth you can get on it. Well, and I, I guess it's also worth mentioning that that um when you play live, that environment is really forgiving as far as tone goes. Yeah. As long as it doesn't sound terrible, it'll be just fine. It, but but I mean I, I think the zoom is good enough that I'd still use it for recording purposes, but like good enough is good enough for live. Except for distortions. The the digital distort <laughs> the, the HX does good distortions, but uh, I would always have an actual big muff for my fuzz sound yeah yep got yeah. gotta have one of those the green one i have two actually <laughs> <laughs> you, you did a good video on that but i find it's just even you kind of touched on this for filling up the sound especially because i'm in two tree pieces the zoom just gives this huge sound that the digital effects it, it doesn't work like they don't do it like the, it i don't know how what it is but the distortion just isn't as full really is it for when you're in a band in a live situation yeah it's it's it just um like because fuzz just inherently does cut your low end a little bit mm. and even though the the fuzzes on here do have like a clean blend a lot of times it's still just somehow how like doesn't quite give you that oh, that grunt in the low end running out of time 10 minutes <gasps> left for fuck's sake oh, oh no I'll, I'll i'll stitch the the episodes together <laughs> Fuck you, Zoom. <laughs> I know what's happening now. The <laughs> pandemic is over and they're like, chairs are like plummeting. They're like, we need to get a new business model here. Like no one in the world <laughs> is paying for this anymore. For real. They were paying for it when like families had to come on and do like quiz, family quiz night or something for hours. <laughs> oh my 
<laughs> I didn't do that. Jesus, my my parents barely don't want to use their smartphones. Never mind. Oh, Zoom. Nope. I I've basically done that for a living for a long time. Is dealing with old people and technology. And uh, nope, not gonna do it on my free time too. Call call centers. That kind of stuff you do is there. Mm -hmm. A lot of tech support for like hey. a decade. So, so <laughs> you've obviously got a lot of patience. Maybe you should have been like a guitar teacher. That that takes an equal amount of patience. I, I, I did teach guitar, guitar and bass when I was in college. So it was like, it was kind of a cool time. I was, I was paying my way through school just with music. It was kind yeah, of fun. Yeah. I had like 30 students or something. I really? Was doing really I, well. I, I, don't, I don't have, well, I have a good few at the moment. I was teaching today, but yeah, 30 is a lot. It might sound like a lot to someone who does, hasn't taught before, but that your head would be fried by the end of the week with 30 oh, students. Oh, yeah. They come just back to back to back. Like, every it's kid good for is your playing, dramatically though. different. It, if they're good players themselves, it can be good for your playing because you're learning lots of yeah. difficult parts. Like, Oh, yeah. But but that's also a double-edged sword because some weeks you're like feeling lazy. You don't want to do anything. But then all the good students expect you to prepare something for them. <laughs> and then you've got one lad who'll be playing Seven Nation Army for nine months. And you're like, oh, thank God he's here. Because I, I don't have to prepare at new. <laughs> totally got that. Yeah, the, the the one kid who like never practices and never improves, and then you have the other kid. It's like, well, I guess I'm gonna show you how to do sweet picking, even though I don't really know how to do it. I think yeah, you yeah. can. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to stay on top of it, <laughs> stay, catch up with him. All right, give me another before we get kicked out. Of this one, give me another um uh, preset. Um, so kind of like you, I've got the, I've got the synth one. So, you know, Boogie on Reggae Woman, the Stevie Wonder song? No. So it's got a, a fun part and I think it's played on keyboard, but this is the patch that I came up with to kind of mimic that. <laughs> Nice, that's yeah. class, yeah. <laughs> that was that was that was fun. I think I know the song now that I'm here. Steve, he has a lot of cool synth parts of played yeah. on. I saw on your YouTube you do play keyboard synth a bit as well, do you? A, t a tiny bit. I I grew up playing piano, so from the time that I was seven till I graduated high school, my mom had me and all of my siblings in in piano lessons. So that that made guitar feel really easy to learn as a teenager, mm. just having those skills. So, yeah, a little, little bit of piano. Don't play much lately, but need, need to get it get it back out because the synth bass stuff is super fun too. Yeah, it's very it's a different technique to play in piano. You're kind of bouncing off the notes. It's more uh, percussive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I might I must get one. They're saying it makes you more employable as a bass player. <laughs> I don't I, I don't know. Do I want to learn? I'm, do you know what? I'm actually okay at playing the notes, but I find all the the knobs and getting all the right waves and stuff a bit of a, you know, a, a, a task, you know, to learn. If I'm not used to doing it, like, you know, it takes a while. It's a lear steep learning curve. That's what I'm looking for to oh, learn totally. all that stuff. So, yeah, like when you're playing bass guitar, you just like there, you know, there's a note. You just hit hit a string. But when you're on on uh, on a synth, you're literally making music from from its basis thing. Like, OK, I want this kind of, you know, sound wave, sound wave or, a, you know, sine wave or a square mm. wave or whatever and i'm going to do all of these things to it and understanding how all of those interact together are like like if if you look at it at the zoom pedal and you think that's complicated that's it's this is easy mode compared to synthesis for sure <laughs> yeah i have one here belong to my um, girlfriend but i never used it so i'll get it out during the summer <laughs> what what have you got there uh let me have a look it's a a, mic a brute micro synth a, what? a oh, micro brute okay. yeah okay yeah it's just a good one. It has a really cheap keyboard, but it's an expensive synth. But I don't. Maybe that's the thing, is it? <laughs> All the the brains in it is is where the magic's at. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, you were saying about the PF five hundred. Yeah, it's it's just a it's just a bad amp. It's a poorly designed amp, and it took me because it blew up at, at a at a sound check for a theater gig, and I actually got. The, like a, the saxophone player in that group is also a bass player. And he's like, dude, I have that same amp. Let me go and get it. And we can just like, the show will go on. And then his also failed that same night before what? the show started. What? And what year did this, so we're talking about your worst ever bass purchase. So what year mm -hmm. did this um, Ampeg come out like? 
I want to say it was in the early 2010s that they came out with these. They were there. They're kind of like the flip top deal, like their yeah. their modern flip top thing. Same look, that was... but a modern make of it. Is it correct? Yeah. So it's yeah. it's a flip top, but a solid state one. Mm. But yeah, it, it took me years to find somebody who could actually fix it, and the fix for it was basically to just like replace everything in it. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I've had I, defective amps yeah. before, and you get to the point where the the guys who fix them just say, "There's no point fixing this because I can't figure out what's wrong with it," and I just spend days trying to find it. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've got it working now and it sounds good. It it was not worth all of the, the heartache and, and money it took to, to, to finally get it going again, though. It's, it's been such a frustrating app. <laughs> really? Uh-huh. Yeah. I have, I have a Warwick amp that has something wrong with it and the guy who fixes the amps couldn't find it. And it got to the point where I'd fix, you know, it's a waste of his time and my money. So I just it's just in my shed now doing nothing, so <laughs> it's too bad. It's just, it has, it's just the amp has some claim to fame. It, the the bass player from White Snake used to own it, but apart from that <laughs> <laughs> y- used to own it, probably yeah, for yeah. good reason. I got caught there. It was like <laughs> Well, I mean, funnily enough, my, my Ampeg was also bought second hand. I got it off a of reverb, so I wonder if that guy knew something too. Yeah, I've never I actually sold something once and I had been using it myself the whole time. And had no problem with it. And then I straight away after I sold it, the guy was contacting me like a crazy person, abusing me, saying I screwed him and it was faulty. But I was like, what do you do in that situation if it was working perfectly? And then he says it's broken when he gets it. But anyway, he ended up blocking me. So I couldn't get his money back. I was thinking about saying, Asher will, I'll take it back. But he blocked me because he was so annoyed. (laughs) Problem solved, I guess. Problem solved, yeah. <laughs> when the trash takes itself out. <laughs> yeah, that was handy. But the, uh, the only thing I bought, I don't know, I've bought so much stuff over the years. I, it's like that. I wouldn't say it was bad, but I hate, I, I'm, I'm going to get rid of, I probably have a Sire M7 and has like loads of buttons and stuff. And it's just like, I just don't see, I'm like, what is the point of these act? Uh, as a gigging musician, I don't see many people playing them live. Like, it's like, you're never on a gig and you're like, oh, I just need to get a tiny bit more mid-range or a bit more treble or I need to dial in all these sounds with all these knobs. You you don't have, you can't do that in a gig. You've got a million other things to be thinking about. And also it won't make a difference at a big gig because the sound engineer at the front of the house is controlling all your bass sound pretty much like. And if, if you do something a bit outrageous, he'll just take it out. He'll be like, what's he doing? That's terrible. Mm. Yep. Sound, sound guys don't like to to deal with a moving target for sure. No. I, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned that sire because I actually played one a little while ago. Um, this band does like live karaoke. We went there for like a friend's birthday, and because we're uh, friends with the drummer, and they were like, "Oh, you guys should you should sit in for a song." I'm like, "Okay." So it, you know, pick up this guy's sire jazz bass, and it has six thousand knobs on it. I'm like, "What the fuck? <laughs> what are all the? Why? The, none of the? Okay, I'm not touching anything. Just you know, because that's just you know." Um, courtesy would you like use somebody else's gear mm. but i just think like what what is all this doing here like <laughs> yeah it's just it's just put that mark that industry of selling bases to people who, who aren't gigging a lot i think because even marcus miller he he doesn't really play them live he yeah he, he plays his custom fenders doesn't he which have a lot of knobs but i, I don't know does he use all those different settings like i i think that they're like it's it's kind of like when you go to get deodorant if you went into the store and there were two kinds of deodorant, it would be way easier to choose deodorant. But instead, you have like 16 and you're like, well, what's the difference? Like, I don't have time to like A-B all of these things. No. <laughs> and then you just get like an option overload. And and same thing with, with equipment. Like fewer options is better as long as every option has like a purpose. And I feel like even in a recording studio, you have so many options in post. Like as long as you get a good clean like your performance is, is really like the critical part and yeah. any of anything recording or live. But like, as long as you get a good take, you can do anything you want in post-production these well, days. Well, they're like, especially pointless in the studio when you think about it, because all those knobs just let you affect the EQ. And obviously you can do that after you've recorded. So <laughs> what's the uh, point? Like, I don't know. I, and, I've, I've yet yeah. to meet someone who really convinced me why active bases are what the point of them. I don't. I, I just don't see the what's the point of them. Apart from they can be louder and stuff like that. 
<laughs> they're just not doing it. But well, actually, my, the recording it wasn't turned on, so I just I just got out my hollow body bass, and um, I was telling you that these are really good for playing with effects because they give like a fundamental bass frequency instead of like you know loads of overtones and the synth effects really like that. So I'll just put on. Did I do this? this yeah. If you went through that with an active bass, it would just be flying all over the place. The synth wouldn't be able to pick up the frequency, really. Mm-hmm. Hot, hot tip for anybody out there who doesn't have a hollow body, just turn the tone knob down if you have stuff that's like struggling to track. It'll give you that same kind of effect where it's just like you limit the number of frequencies that go into it, and then your like, octave pedal doesn't get confused. Uh, and how, where do you stand on the short scales? I, I, I never had... This is the first one I ever had, like, and I just bought this on a whim, but... I really like. Let me get a bit of delay. I I really like the whole short scale thing. It, it makes mm-hmm. you play completely different, and especially. Oh yeah. For. A... It's hard to play on Zoom, isn't it? It's like. This is more nerve wracking than playing for like two thousand people. <laughs> You've got an audience of one. <laughs> yeah, just staring at you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I've got a little uh, uh, Fender Mustang on my wall, and I re- I really like it. It's it's a super fun little bass. the The thing that I find with it that when I took it took it out is that it's kind of neck heavy, and I don't know if that's because it's short scale or because of some other reason. But, but yeah, the t- the tone of it's really fun. Like it, it does. Um, does have like a like a more focused fundamental, mm. and I feel like probably some people would mistake that for it being boomy, but I don't know. It's 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 really good for fuzz. In fact, I I had a friend who made like a Halloween um, song, and I thought you know it'd be funny if I use this little pink bass <laughs> for this Halloween track, but then just put fuzz on it, make it sound really mean, and it came yeah. out super good. Nice, yeah, yeah. It, I like. I've seen that the shell pink. Is it that? The yeah, most time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Square is it a real Fender? It, it's American a one. player series Fender, yeah. So it's like their Mexican Fender. I actually bought it from one of those like rich dudes. He just was flipping money. It had still had the the plastic on the pit guard. And <laughs> so I used it in a video, and I just didn't you know care to keep it. And I was like, cool, sold. And I think I bought it for five fifty, and now they go for like eight or nine hundred because the world is nuts. <laughs> yeah, oh, Korea. I yeah, buying instruments right now is a disaster. Just. Not happening. I might get. Nope. It. I I applied for a government grant to get half the price paid on a base. So we'll see in July if that comes through. I'll have a a neon green G and L. What kind of G and L? I asked. For, uh, no, no, not G and L. Sorry, a sire. I applied. To oh. Get, um. Did you see those new short scale sires? They're pretty much like a Fender Aerodyne, but a short scale. Oh, I hadn't seen those. No. So I, I played my main active? gig and bases in Aerodyne, so I was like, no, they're not active. Passive. They're okay, active. they are passive. So, Happy days. So, uh, what, so what's your plan for the future of the, the channel? Like, do you ever see yourself trying to make a living with the channel or is it always just going to be like a hobby? I, I think it would be cool to, to just do YouTube full time, but I, I, I don't think it'll happen. I, I feel like bass is pretty niche mm. and the guys that are like really, you know, pulling numbers there, like they've, they've got the, the space occupied. For me, it's just like a fun thing to do. Mm. Keeps me active and exploring where i probably wouldn't otherwise yeah i i have no delusions about where i stand and everything <laughs> yeah I, I think i had some idea i didn't think i was going to make a living off youtube but when i started doing that i thought you know i might make a few bob off it but it's tough it, it's bad for your mental health isn't it trying to mm-hmm. you, keep making these videos like you you make once one a month kind of or maybe more on a good month yeah, I I was kind of shooting for two a month, and sometimes that happens, and sometimes it doesn't. It's like I I've got too much other stuff going on. Sometimes it's a it's tough. It's a bad hole to get into though. Trying to keep up with them once a week, it's it's crazy. Like because it takes so many hours, and you could be in a bad mood, and you're like, I don't want to talk to a camera. Or... Do you, and it's so many hours spent not doing the thing you want to do. It's it's all yeah. editing. <laughs> editing yeah, takes all editing. so long. And had you ever do, had had any experience with videos before you started on YouTube, or is pretty much all your video editing from making base videos? 
all all of my video editing experience is just YouTube self taught. Yeah, trying to here. figure out. I never did new... anything before, but it's it's fun though. It, it was I'm going to start doing it again now in the summer. I have a bunch of videos planned. Like I I don't know, but it's hard to know. Like you kind of I I got sick of trying to. I was trying to do more. I was at the start of maybe I was doing videos I thought would get lots of views, but you get bored of that fairly quickly, don't you? You just kind of want to do your own thing. Hmm. It's yeah. It's sometimes the thing that you're most interested in doesn't necessarily make for the most compelling content, and so like I don't know. It's it's a tough thing, and the the thing that's that does well on YouTube is constantly changing. So it's just hard to say like one video will do really well, and then another similar video just doesn't. And I don't know. It'd be nice if more people just had channels like like yourselves or me. Like we're not. We don't think we're going to be the next Adam Neely. Just putting up videos for the fun like it'd be nice yeah it'd be good if more people started just firing up stuff and oh you know here's some licks that i know or uh whatever bass covers and stuff okay it, it, having the channel is good for practicing it kind of mm-hmm. because when you hear yourself recorded you hear all the mistakes <laughs> you're like you're like oh i can play that song perfectly and then you go to actually record it and even video it then it makes it even harder to play it right totally just and, and like when you're a one-man show it's like trying to have your camera set up and then like all of your recording gear and like you also have to put on a good performance so it's like all of these moving parts and you're the only one doing anything like if you had a crew it would be way easier to to do all this stuff but it's a one man show there's a lot to keep track of i think being good at youtube just requires so many random skills to come all in. You got to have like graphic design and video editing, and you've got to have good public speaking skills on top of being really good at your instrument. Because if you're just like mediocre, then you'll end up like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just play, I just a, a bass. We're both, we play bass. We can play in bands, but we're not like shredding on the bass, which like what's oh. uh, Charles Bertude. Like that's another, that's a different avenue of YouTubing. You're just because mm-hmm. he's so phenomenally good in that virtuosic side of things. But he was on YouTube for ages before he got big. It was just he got a break off Davy Five Hundred Four, and that kind of blew him up. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad his playing is getting a lot of attention because he's phenomenally good. I I don't have any interest in ever playing like that, but it's <laughs> I it's actually entertaining covered one sure. of his pieces before he <laughs> blew up. It, but it was just a tapping piece. He has a tapping book he had out for years before his YouTube channel. And uh, it's well worth getting if you're into tapping. Uh, he, he wrote it with a guest who was on this podcast before, Jim Sinet. He was his teacher. like. But um, it's a really good. The pieces are really nice. Like They're not like f- really fast, but they teach you all the shapes for tapping and stuff. He has a course on S- SBL now, but I don't know. Do you have a, a Scott Space Lessons membership? It's Yeah, lot, I never met many uh-huh. people that do. I I have very conflicted feelings about Scott's bass lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lifetime membership. I just got it years ago, so it's great. Ah, uh, I can just pop in and see what's going on there anytime I want. But I don't think there's any bass player on the planet that could get through that much content, <laughs> that many nope. bass lessons. No, nope. there's a lot there. My my uh my bass t- my bass teacher said that he he looked into Scott's ba- bass lessons and he was just like, this stuff is like bass crack. It, it tries to make you dependent on it like that you'll just like constantly want to have like more of it and it mm. just like makes you dependent somehow and i don't know exactly what he meant by that because like i i don't know what they look like but that was just uh, what, i know what he means like, one line like um, me. there's all these brilliant and I'm, it is really good and it's class but i think what what happens a lot of people in it the, the negative for a lot of people is there's these brilliant courses but like in reality, for most bass players, myself included, one of those courses would take me 12 months to master. But like, you don't master it. You're like, all right, move on. There's this new thing. And I want to be class at tapping or playing jazz fusion. But you've got, <laughs> you're you still working on the pentatonic scale course. You know, we're doing the five yeah. shapes of the pentatonic. So uh, to really learn something on bass is like seven, eight, a year, oh, seven or eight months or a year of like practice. But when there's new stuff coming all the time, you're like, you know, you get, you're like a magpie. Oh, shiny. I'll move yeah. on. To that's probably what your teacher meant. Like, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Where, and, and the funny thing is that you can, you can take lessons for a little while and then be good enough to play in a band in eight months, a year. Like it, like the, the barrier of entry for, for professional bass playing is quite, quite low 
Yeah, it's an, it, I think the best way to describe bass, because people often ask me, is bass easy? And I say, it's really yeah. easy <laughs> instrument, but it's a very difficult instrument to master. It's yeah. an easy instrument to learn, but it's difficult. And if you really want to get into that advanced bass, bass and bass playing, yeah, Scott SBL is brilliant for that. But mm-hmm. you, you still get lessons, do you, regularly enough? I, I was taking lessons until I... I ran out of time i I started a new job that makes me work 50 hours a week and so like i i hated showing up to lessons and being like i didn't have time to practice this week (laughs) you were the bad student (laughs) i was a bad student i just didn't have time it's like i got this you know sub gig where i have to learn three hours of music and i have to make this video and like i i'm just like sacrificing practice time in favor of of all these other things because i just don't have time but if if i had time i would definitely be taking lessons because like just i'll just get right in here for everybody bass lessons are very worth it get a good teacher and take bass lessons because yeah yeah i'm, I'm getting will... lessons at the moment oh, they're unbelievable so like, good because one thing that was interesting for me was um you know that kind of um it's see that what's it called the raking you know that raking thing that pino oh, does and yeah. i was like oh i'm i can do that easy and then when my teacher saw me doing it he's like yeah that's not quite it so, but <laughs> <laughs> but when i was practicing at home it was just oh yeah no bother you do a few pull-offs little 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 easy but like it's not easy and there's an exact way of doing it but it wasn't until i went to lessons i realized i was doing it wrong and then i had to learn how to do it like it's things like that that you think you've mastered but then mm-hmm. when you go to someone, they can point out how you're not doing it right, like or how you could do it better even. Yeah. My my little thing was pick playing. Because yeah. when I when I would play with a pick, if you if you come in at, at an angle, you'll get pick scraping. Yeah. And you probably won't like notice it that much. Whereas if you just like pick straight across, then you just get the note. Mm. And that and that was something like, oh, of of course. Like why didn't I it's you just have to have like that outside expert um perspective and you can fix all kinds of things with your playing yeah and then you that's no idea. that's only the start of it the technique then you've like all the theory that a good teacher can teach you and mm-hmm. show you in you know stuff you're not really that you wouldn't be too familiar with your genres or whatever like so so if, did you just recently start lessons or have uh, well, you been I, taking I'm doing a bass masters i'm doing a masters at the moment so oh, as part killer. of it i'm getting the bass lessons with noel hey noel if you're listening and uh <laughs> they, their class really loving it like learning loads so and i did get music lessons as a teenager but that was with, with a, a drummer who just t- he taught me like the fundamentals of music chris faby which was brilliant but this is my first time is oh i got lessons off anthony mutaraja as well do you know the youtuber i don't uh, i don't recognize uh, the name he has a big channel but i got zoom lessons off him during lockdown which were class so okay. I've been dipping into it last years for the fun of it, you know, just to try it out, like. Right on. And I get a lot out of it. I definitely do, like. So, the, but the, uh, the pick playing is something I got into during lockdown as well, and it's really, I do a lot of it now in gigs. I, I really like it. You can just do stuff you can't do with your fingers, and certain yeah, stuff is easier, like. Different, different, different attack, different sound. Yeah, definitely. I can't. I can't believe that people are still arguing about pick playing versus fingers in, know, in the year of our Lord twenty twenty two. They I, still go after it. I sure they'll argue. They'd argue about anything on the internet. Like they just, <sighs> they'll just find that an excuse to argue. <laughs> so what, so what's... yeah. Here here are the here are the two takeaways from this podcast. Get lessons. Stay the fuck off of base forums. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't remember the last time I was ever on a base forum. I don't know what what I never. Well, maybe if I want, sometimes I'm like, what's the best fuzz bass line or something? I go on like to see what people are thinking, but generally there's not much to be got on those forums. It's it's a the blind leading the blind most of the time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So what? So any cool videos coming up that you can give us a sneak preview of? Or do, are you going to do any more live streams? You've done some good live streams where you're kind of you were yeah. going through like a tier list of sounds and stuff. Yeah, in fact, I I do want to do, do more live content. I I I thought the the tier list idea was really fun, and I might do that with a couple of other other uh, categories of stuff on the, on the Zoom. Probably go through the amps next. Um, 
But then I'm also doing collaborations with the, the base channel. So I had my How to Sound Like series, and they liked it. And Chris said, you should just put your videos on our channel. Because mm. they have... The base you know, channel? Is that... That's not the... Oh, base the world is the guy with the German guy. The base channel. Yeah. I've probably watched it. I'm just not too the, familiar with the people who host it. The, the base channel is largely like gear reviews. Mm. So they, they review a lot of, you know, bases and pedals and amps and stuff. But they, he's just wanting to diversify what they offer on there. And so, so I, I have a series on there and the, the one I'm, I'm working on now, and it's the whole reason why I was playing the stingray today is working on a, how to sound like flea video. Oh, nice. So watch for that coming and out. You'll have to get the pick out I for finish. that. Uh, by the way, is when he started playing with a pick, wasn't it? By the way, you're at kind of. Was it that late? No, yeah. he, he has a pick song on. I, I was just looking at this. Hang on. I think it's on Californication, if I Okay, yeah, maybe correctly. around that time, because I was... Parallel making... parallel something or other is oh, what it's yeah, called. Oh, yeah, Parallel Universe. Ticka, 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 yep. ticka. That, that's the one. Yep. That, and it's on Californication. You have a lot of... So, so you're, you have to do a lot of, like, tricky flea bass lines for that lesson, obviously. <laughs> yeah, shredding hard. <laughs> have you got a Sir Psycho Sexy preset on the Zoom? We're going to have to. I haven't I haven't actually, like, dialed anything Use in. Use that for terrible play. boss yeah. synth. Uh, pedal for that song it's a really crap pedal if you ever used it, it was uh, like... my favorite thing that i found thus far just like researching flea's gear is he has his tech doing like this premiere guitar video where they they you know rig rundown i yeah. think is what it is and they go through his pedals and he has like a cutron on there mm, nice he says pedal. yeah we we use that on a, a couple of songs and the interviewer goes like, oh yeah which songs and he goes oh um we we use it on sir psycho sexy <laughs> I anyway, there the next pedal. It just like <laughs> yeah. one song for this giant Q trod pedal. Yeah, he was never really an effects bass player. Anyway, he was never not at all, like... not at all. It's just like fuzz and then an envelope filter sometimes. Yeah. I, I actually like his list. um rendition of um the national anthem that he did there a few weeks ago. A lot of people were making fun of it, but <laughs> I was really ready for it to be bad. But it was I thought it was cool. Did you see that though, Dara? I think it was the the Lakers game or something. He did it. I, I heard about it, but I didn't watch it. I, I kind of figured it would be like the, the Jimi Hendrix yeah, Star Spangled kind of Banner, thing, yeah. which was less of a, a like musical tribute to his country and more of a like protest sort of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was good. Anyway, so do you want to... I'm going to get kicked out again by this Zoom thing. I'm going to get this started. And of course, if I, knew, I, I only started a Patreon last week, so if someone wants to throw <laughs> me a few bob... And AMP as well. You're on Patreon as well, aren't you? That's right. That's right. You can give us both a few, Bob. Go over our lowest tier so you can spread the love, you know. It's only a dollar. Yeah, one dollar. dollar. Uh, do you want to give us a flea bass line? Uh, with some oh, sh- Zoom sure. I'll, goodness. I'll give you the, uh, the Guitar Center special. You ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta sneak that in there somehow. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking I'll forward to that out. video. That's a good one. I, I know yeah. your man. Uh, what's his? Uh, I had, I've had so many guests on now. I'm starting to forget. Well, I got COVID <laughs> twice last month, so I've, oh. I've got like serious COVID brain fog. So I keep going oh, to. No. Care. I, I kind of grasp the names of people, and then it's just not there. But I'm sure that will <laughs> that will come back soon. Like. But uh, yeah, give us another sound there before we get kicked out. Um, thanks well, a lot for see. coming on. It was well, a thank you for having me. quicker than my usual podcast, but we were trying to find a time that suited both of us and with the time difference. So we, we could do it again, definitely. Maybe even do a live one or something. If we yeah. have like a ta- give ourselves something to talk, a task to do, like to get done. And then we can do it live with people on. They can ask us questions and stuff. There we go. I, I, I'd be down for that. Let's see. Uh, another flea bass line, or even just some cool zoom sound from your patches. Oh no no, hang on, we got this. Uh, da, 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 da. That was class. Yeah, I loved it. 
So cheers for, I know it's only the middle of the day for you, but it's, I did 10 lessons in a row before I came on this chat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'd be half asleep, but I actually got, I, I, I got energized, you know, it was no bother. I drank some tea. <laughs> I got. Well, a, I appreciate you having me on. I it's got been a, super fun. I got a podcast mug off one of my fans. Put my oh, there you go. Logo on it. <laughs> Perfect. That's and great. Very self indulgent. Have my own cup, but I didn't buy it, so it's okay. <laughs> Have my face it on it. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, we'll do it again. Um, I, I'm. I'll start out this Zoom thing, but now at least we know we can't go on Zoom for hours and hours anymore. One on one. Yeah, they yep. always catch it. Sad day. It's yeah, a sad, sad day. day. <laughs> for people who want to have zoom parties <laughs> well have a nice evening and um we'll do it again we'll do a more longer one this was just an introduction to amp check his base channel out check out his patreon and um if anyone has any questions about zoom b3 pedals where do you guys ask because we're kind of we're endorsing them but we're not getting paid to do it <laughs> and we should and we should Hint, hint. We're, we're shilling them hard <laughs> yeah big time we're really pushing hard to get I, well, I don't know do I need like 10 zoom pedals in my shed yeah, it'd be nice to have, have an extra one you know that I didn't have to keep taking it up every time I want to go do a gig but. it wouldn't be bad to have a backup because they don't take up hardly any room no they're great so yeah we're endorsing them go out and buy one they're fast <laughs> they won't break the bank right up cheers man Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much, Stephen. No bother, Have a good dude. night. <laughs> Take care.